The Hornets won a basketball game over the weekend. It felt like their Super Bowl with the new look Hornets. And then earlier today, we got the news that Mitch Kupchak would be moving into an advisory role within the organization. There's a lot to break down. Let's get to it right here on Locked on Hornets. You are Locked on Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast. And that includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Wonder if the Hornets are using this new GM basketball of operations job available for anybody that wants it. Anybody that has a good track record, LinkedIn can make it easier for the Charlotte Hornets if they wanted to use them. And so feel free to go to LinkedIn jobs and use it yourself. That's Doug Branson. You can find him on the sub stack, every Hornets box score.com writing all sorts of positive Hornet stuff over the weekend. And we'll have to see what he writes mm. about this Mitch Kupchak news. Cause mm. it just broke. We're recording just so everybody knows a little peek behind the curtain at nine 24 AM this monday the news came in around what doug like 8 45 i think it on was- my way into work i bike into work i've got one yep. of these like e-bikes you know you can turn them up to you can, you can like turn the motor up and as soon as i heard the news come down on sirius xm i turned my bike to turbo i said i gotta get to the studio well, <laughs> we got a lot to talk about I also i saw you tweet like four minutes after i texted you did you tweet like mid biking i've heard of driving and tweeting which isn't great <laughs> but what about biking and tweeting and did you put other people in danger by doing that only myself i mean everybody okay. else has got the two-ton death machines i would have been the only one hurt in that scenario but listen this is uh you, you gotta be you gotta be on top of this stuff man i mean you know it's breaking news it's true all right i'm walker mail you can listen to me on wfnz every weekday Viking from 12 news. to 3 p.m we do have some news here as we were mentioning mitch Kupchak basketball head of basketball operations before now no longer he served as the team's uh president of basketball ops and general manager since 2018 he's moving into a consultant role with the organization the team officially announced i guess just before 9 a.m today a search for the new general manager will begin immediately and Kupchak will remain in his current post until a successor is found this is all found in the Charlotte Observer, written up immediately by Rod Boone, who, of course, covers the Charlotte Hornets. A couple more quotes I'll mention real quickly. As Mitch nears the end of his contract, we agreed that now was the right time to begin the search in order to put the organization in the best position for the upcoming offseason. This quote coming in from Hornets coach chairman Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin after they released a statement. Quote, we're excited to begin the hiring process for our new head of basketball ops as we continue to shape this franchise and work towards building a team for long-term sustainable success. We'll leave it here. We did see this John Hollinger tweet. You mentioned John Hollinger last week saying it was the hottest rumor during the trade deadline. It's the hottest rumor, guys. You guys have no idea how hot this is. Mitch Kupchak might be gone after the trade deadline from his GM title. It turns out to be true. What do you make of the news really just a few days after they operated the way they did at the deadline? Yeah, it's not shocking. It's not surprising. Uh, Whenever a a team shifts into new ownership, you expect a shakeup. Sometimes it happens instantly. And and other times, like in this situation, the owners are very clear, like we're using this year to evaluate uh, everyone's performance. And then then they'll make some decisions moving forward. And, And it makes sense to do it now. Uh, because you know you can get that new person set up, ready to go, ready for this upcoming offseason, which will be very important for the Hornets, who now own two additional first-round draft picks to deal with, and and they'll have their own draft coming up as well. So uh, this it feels like the right time. It feel I mean it's I think it's certainly the right move. It's time to move into a new era of front office uh, for this new ownership group. I'll be interested to talk about some of these names that have come up in this Woj report as well. Uh, But when you look back on the cup check era of Charlotte Hornets basketball, in terms of the draft, there were some, there was certainly some hits and some positive things to talk about. 
But I think it will be defined by the fact that there were zero playoff appearances, a couple of play-in blowouts, but zero playoff appearances. And a lot of a lot of young players, some of those players developed, but not a lot of veteran presence on the team, not a lot of maturity on this team. And they never really fielded a roster that I felt was a, a serious threat to, to get into the playoffs, but also to make noise once they were in the playoffs. And that's because I don't feel like the front office, and I'm going to include former ownership here in Michael Jordan, they were never prepared monetarily to get involved and use all the tools in terms of free agency and dra- and, and trades that you have to do in order to, to field a serious roster. And they always leaned on this idea that Charlotte – you know, had all of these limitations. It was all about what Charlotte couldn't do in terms of roster building instead of being creative, being positive, and, and fielding a vision for folks to get behind. And ultimately, I think that's what led us here today. So Mitch Kupchak did say, after signing my extension two years ago, the plan has always been for me to move to an advisory role after this season when my contract ends in June. This is what Kupchak said earlier. Now it feels like the appropriate time to begin the search for the next leader of our basketball ops. I want to thank Michael Jordan for hiring me and bringing me to Charlotte. I'd like to thank Rick and Gabe for their support since becoming majority owners, and I appreciate the relationship that we have developed. I really like the core of our team, including our additions at the trade deadline, I'm excited to watch their continued growth and development. The Hornets are in good hands with Rick and Gabe, and I look forward to helping any way I can. I believe our future is bright. We don't have a lot of information. I did want to touch on that one of those last sentences in that statement. The future is in bright hands um, with Rick and Gabe, or they have a bright future in the hands of Rick and Gabe. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true based off what we've seen so far? If we are to believe that ownership was driving the decision-making at the trade deadline, not negotiating. I think Mitch Kupchak deserves credit for what you got in return for PJ, what you were able to get in return for Terry Rozier, the Gordon Hayward trade. Even if you're telling Mitch, Hey, do this, get the most that you can. That's fine. That's absolutely fine from ownership, but Mitch gets credit for the negotiation there. Still, ownership deserves some credit also, and so now we have this decision to move on from Mitch. We'll figure out who has this new GM title. Do we have enough information, at least at the beginning, in chapter one, if you will, to say, you know what, I do think the organization is in um, good hands with these two guys who continue to make decisions I think we both agree with, Doug. For sure. I think it's still TBD. They have gotten a little bit more aggressive now with these trades to set themselves up for the future. I really believe that like it's less about the firing and more about the hiring. How aggressive do they get in terms of bringing a big name into the front office if they decide to move on from Steve Clifford later on at the end of the season? How aggressive do they get uh, to bring in a candidate? Because look, the, the ownership, that's where they can make a difference. They can open up the wallet at that point. There's no salary cap on making those kinds of moves. So how serious are they about bringing real names to this franchise, legitimate people that can, that can, uh, that have sway, you know, especially the front office. I mean, you got to have guys that have relationships across the NBA to get those kinds of deals done in free agency or in trade. But I thought one of the funniest uh, or, or interesting quotes from Mitch Kupchak after the trade deadline was when he was asked about how involved the owners were and Gabe Plotkin was on the call. I don't think he said anything yep. on the call, but he was on the call, which is like, Oh, the boss showing up to the call. You kind of had a sense right then that like, okay, something is afoot. Um, but he said that he was surprised by the basketball knowledge of the ownership group, how, how they sort of knew you know, what what players uh, they, they wanted to target and what players were capable of what. Um, but but frankly, like this trade down and, and we're going to talk about it, you know, uh, coming up here, their their impact on this uh, first game. Yeah. But it was like, yes, you need playmaking. Like it, it doesn't take a basketball genius to look at this roster pre trade deadline and understand where the deficiencies were. And yet, for whatever reason, look, you can either believe that Cup Check didn't have the relationships or that he didn't have the basketball knowledge anymore that the game had passed him by and he wasn't able to fairly evaluate his own roster and maybe put too much stock into the young players that he was responsible for drafting you could believe that or you could believe that ownership group uh, or former owner Michael Jordan tied his hands and said look I don't want to go into the sal- I don't want to go above the salary cap I don't want to go into the tax land I don't want to be in- involved in any kind of aprons 
And so, you know, make your moves accordingly and tied his hands in that way. And then, you know, look, Mitch Kupchak has tight relationships with Mike. It's why he's going to be an organizational advisor or whatever, because he has relationships with Jordan and he has relationships with Plotkin and Schnall now. And whatever you believe, the fact of the matter is the Hornets did not make the playoffs during his tenure. And they yep. had some serious draft issues as well. And so that's why we're here today. And and I think it was a good time to make the move. I'm glad they didn't wait until, you know, right before draft night. You see teams do that, and people look at those teams and say, those teams don't know what they're doing because they waited too long. Well, this team didn't wait too long. All right. So you, Mitch Kupchak is out as GM and head of basketball ops. Who are the other names? Let's get to it in the other segment. Coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Will reveal some of the names in consideration to be the next GM. And we already have a pretty good scent, a good lead on who it might be, at least to dwindle it down to just a few different players. That was a sniffle. I don't know if that was a scent. Was a you said, didn't you say yeah. scent or did you I, say scent? I, I did. I think that was, that was quite, it looked like you were, you know, almost. That was me doing a scent. Gotcha. Was me doing a scent. Like my beagle. Look like Doug Beagle Branson, baby. <laughs> That's what Doug is doing. We'll see who the other names are on the other side of the break coming up next. Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates in the first place. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring, partly because of that reason. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, I lied. We're not going to talk about the quality candidates coming up next, not from LinkedIn, but just from Gabe Plotkin and Rick Schnall trying to figure out who the next GM is going to be. We can get to that in the third segment. But Doug said, hey, do you just want to talk about the game? And you know what? I had a feeling this was going to happen. I haven't seen Doug this excited in a long time. And I'm happy because Doug has been feeling the Hornets fever for how terrible the Hornets have been for really quite a while now, but also this season. And I'm glad that not only did they have a great NBA trade deadline, we both agreed with that. That was a fun show that we did just a couple of episodes ago, but we got to see those new additions after what was just a dreadful Friday night performance against the Milwaukee Bucks. It was absolutely horrible. JT Thor got sham God by Thanasis at Like, yeah, it, it got to levels I didn't know existed in the NBA. Even though I wasn't shocked, I still didn't expect it to get that bad. All It's fine because we got to honor Gerald Wallace at home against the Memphis Grizzlies, a team, by the way, that he had a buzzer beater tip in against. I was there. One of my favorite games I've ever attended. Underrated moment in Bobcats history, in my opinion. And you also get the win. Because of Vasil, yes, Michic, and then you can do your thing, Michic, you chitch. We all chitch, according to Doug Branson. You know, if you're not watching YouTube, Doug is flirting with putting on the big dub hat. And it was against the Memphis Grizzlies. They do not have a very good basketball team right now. In fact, they're quite bad, given all of the injuries. Doug, I'll leave it up to you. What are you, what are you doing? All right, fine. I get it because, you know, a lot of people have commented about the context of this game. It was against the Grizzlies, one of the few teams that the Hornets went up against this year that were just as injured in terms of the severity of the players. The you know, Hornets and, might and have I had it better than the Grizzlies, which is saying a lot and might not even be true, to be honest. But the fact that it's debatable, you know, goes to show you how bad off they are. Right. And the Grizzlies were involved in the trade deadline, too. And so they had some new names that they were trying to figure out. You know, mm -hmm. so obviously these were two bottom dwelling teams 
Not a lot of people are going to talk about this game. Not a lot of people are going to know about the context of what the Hornets have been through. And so this one was truly for the sickos. So I'll grant you that. Instead of the big, instead of the big dub hat, I'm going to go with the big M hat for Michich. I mean, okay. oh my God. Well, this I'm Michich glad, no, guy was no, no, incredible. No, no. I, and I want you to talk about all of your favorite qualities. I thought you were going M hat for moral victory, which we could also do because no. you can wear the big moral. No, victory I mean, it wasn't a moral to. victory. It was no, an know, actual that's victory. Why, that's, we don't that's even why. have to talk about moral victories anymore. That would be great. If we're transitioning into an era of Hornets basketball, <laughs> where we have to stop focusing on moral victories and start focusing on actual victories. I would be so pleased with that. But let's, let's look, listen, this game made me well up. Um, and it wasn't just because Del Curry had a nice moment with Seth Curry and there was a little dad stuff going on. And I'm a, you know, I mean, you know, my baby is a couple years old now, but I'm still sort of recent dad. And so that's obviously going to have an emotional impact on me. But that aside, I welled up because this game featured ball movement from Michich, who had a career high in assist. And he's a rookie, but he's kind of not a rookie because he's like 30 plus years old, but he was a Euro League MVP. This guy knows how to move the basketball. He also scored 18 points off the bench. There were so many bench points in this game, so many contributors. Grant Williams needs another shot. Obviously didn't go well in, in Dallas. And if you listen to his comments, they were not so veiled in his thoughts on his time in Dallas. That was weird. He's back home. He was hitting threes. Davis Bertans was moving without the basketball in a way that I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I remember that killing the Hornets. He was hitting three-pointers. They were stretching the floor. Miles Bridges had room to drive, and he didn't face like three defenders every single time. He didn't have to take a 1,000 shots. Brandon Miller didn't either. Both of those guys were super efficient. Like, it was everything that we've been screaming about for weeks, nay, months, nay, years. It was incredible. I loved every moment of it. It refreshed me. I need. I was really in a bad place with the Charlotte Hornets and that game. And I understand the context. And I also, I will be the first to say there are losses ahead for this team. This team is not going to be a threat to make a play in. Okay. I'm just going to lay that out there. And if they prove me wrong, so be it. But I'm going to say they're not making a crazy run. I think you're safe. Okay. But at the same time, we needed that every, all the sickos needed that. That was a boost of whatever ketamine i don't know what do they what do they give people to just like no not ketamine ketamine is what dexter uses to pass out his victims before he kills oh, yeah, them no, so no, the opposite of that whatever the opposite of that is a shot of adrenaline it was a shot of adrenaline there right to the heart yeah. of every single hornet sicko yeah i think that's true and so what would this this game was fun because like i i actually think the turnovers contributed to the fun because there's just action all over the place like they had 19 turnovers in this game but that was by far the worst thing about them. I mean, what you see here is 43 rebounds. So they out rebounded Memphis. That's not anything that we're used to. We are used to 30 assists like this team. We actually have seen good ball movement before, but it's been a long time since we've seen it. Like I can remember the West coast road trip early on where I think I said something like the Clippers game was the best ball movement game we've seen without LaMelo ball. He wasn't playing at that time. And so there were times where you actually did see ball movement, but it had been a long time since we saw offense that looked that organized and guys that just knew how to play the game, basketball IQ guys that were out there sharing the court with one another. I think the 30 assists are a pretty good stat to start with. If you wanted to point to that uh, being a contributing factor to how they were able to win this game. And then the efficiency, uh, yeah. bad shooting night for Martin, two of seven Trey Mann started off hot. He was fun at first, still dished 19 dimes. And so that are nine dimes. And so that's fun. Four of 11 from the field though. Other than that, everybody else shooting pretty damn well. Grant Williams, five of 11, three of six from three Bertans, three of five, both from the free, uh, field and three Michich doesn't hit his three pointers. This is not something you should expect to see going forward, but he hit a couple of the few that he attempted over 51% from distance here, Doug. We're certainly not used to seeing that here recently. It's been Brandon Miller every once in a while, miles, every two games, PJ, who's no longer on the team. And that's about it. Now they at least brought the shooting off of the bench in this game. So yes, we saw a lot of fun things happen in on Saturday that we haven't seen in quite some time. 
it's not about the number of assists. It was about the fact that there were so many players who were making plays for other players. It wasn't just Michich. It was Mann and Nick Richards running like a legit pick-and-roll game. It was Grant Williams getting fed. It was Miles Bridges getting fed. It was There were multiple players moving the basketball, and it was drive-kick, drive-kick. For the past couple of weeks, we've been seeing drive, 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 drive. It was, there was no kick. The kick didn't exist. And now we're getting guys drawing down the defense and moving the basketball. It was crisp. It was clean. It was pretty amazing considering that the Hornets literally, they just swapped out their entire bench. I don't think that's ever happened in NBA history, that a team swaps out their entire bench and plays that well and gets that many bench points. Like that, it is insane. It was the first time they had all gotten together and hooped it up. It was crazy. So the bench is where we should start because those are where all the new additions came in, including a starting Trey Mann, by the way, at the point guard spot. He looked good this, too. Got this, fell in love with himself in the fourth quarter, though. I was like, I was like, all right, Trey Mann, relax a little bit. You know, I mean, pull it back. You, 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 you made you had some found money there, and you should have just like stuck with that. But I, I loved him too. And this is going to be, you know, something I think for Trey Mann, that's that's probably within his realm. But going back to the bench, Woj did say when he was talking about the trade deadline that the Hornets have a bunch of dudes on their bench that might not be in the NBA next year. Like right. none of them, except for PJ, of course, who they gave up a first round for in Dallas. Uh, everybody else, like that's it. And then you see the box score in this game after those comments from Woj, Doug, None of the old bench guys got any minutes. None. Like I'm not like literally zero. This is not hyperbole zero. It was Grant Williams, Davies Bertans, Seth Curry, Michich. That's it. You had four people. And Steve Clifford told you the new guys are going to play tonight. And they did. And they played a lot of minutes. In fact, Bertans played the least amount of minutes in this game. And he logged 12 off of the well. bench. And he came in just firing. And that was it. Well, Steve Clifford also said that uh, th- that they were able to go Grant Williams small ball five because Grant Williams is a physical rebounder <laughs> because because they can play five out and survive defensively. He d- he obviously didn't mention PJ's name, but I don't. It doesn't take much to read between the lines because you can go back to previous comments that he made when PJ was here and they had to go small ball five, and Clifford was adamant like we can't do that because we get crushed on defense and we get crushed on the boards. Uh, Clifford also said, look, high IQ, veteran guys, guys that can move the ball. That's what he's seeing right now. Most teams, if they're serious about getting into the playoffs, this is what I've been talking about for years now with Cupchak. Most teams that are serious go into a season with a, a solid core of starters and then a solid core of bench players that are like NBA rotation level players. And then you have deep reserves. What the Hornets kept going into the season with was a solid group of starters and then deep bench reserves being responsible for bench minutes Mm -hmm. and and that's been the problem all along and that's when you have health issues with the charlotte hornets it absolutely crushed them every single time because then they had to go to players that just needed to be in the g league for a little while and and then come in occasionally to give you that oh where'd that guy come from performance instead they were depending on that performance every night and Bryce McGowan's can't do that JT Thor can't do that Nick Smith Jr. at this moment cannot do that I am interested in the rebounding stuff from Grant because he had eight in this game but Doug he's been actually one of the worst rebounders according to Biggs on cleaning the glass in the (laughs) NBA since he stepped foot on the NBA court so this is the thing that people are saying now. about Grant that's a little surprising. It's like, yeah, it's great. He's home. He had eight rebounds. He's been in the bottom five percentile of bigs for three out of the six years that are five years that he's played. And that includes one percentile like it with Dallas, you know, it's not great. so, so this whole, like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, okay, great. Like I am not here to rain on the parade. If we're, if we're in the business of warning people what to expect via trend and what to maybe just reel back in, then maybe we reel back the Grant Williams stuff in as far as the defense and the rebounding specifically, but people like the toughness from him. And so we'll hope to see him exhibit that continuously. That would be my only thing. The Michich threes, that's something that I don't expect, but the ball of movement is, and I think that's my most valuable trait in players and teams 
because the Hornets have been so good at it before. And like, it was the reason why I was scared to move off of some guards and eventually it would work like Devonte Graham. I was like, man, look, you get a first for Devonte. I understand you making it, but I was very wary of that because Devonte was a good passer. Remember he had a ridiculous assist to turnover ratio whenever they traded him, but it still worked out. Right? Like it, it I love ball movement. And I think Doug, you're seeing that here help guys that aren't very talented compared to other NBA franchises. And so I think that's what we can get excited about. Even if it is against Memphis, that offense looked like it was something more sustainable than we had seen like (laughs) over what, like two months. And that's, what's exciting. We're going to put together at least a good enough looking product against some of the other good teams out there. And even if we lose, that's it. Right. Well, we're going to lose, but that's it because they're not going to shoot that well from three every single game. There are going to be tough nights ahead unless LaMelo ball is able to come back sooner rather than later. So I don't think they're in any danger, but the product is going to be so much more watchable. I just cannot stress how difficult it's been to watch Hornets basketball lately because it hasn't looked like NBA basketball. That's the whole thing. And this is, to me, a shot to the ballot to anyone who's like, play the young guys. Because now you see see it in stark relief, what Mm -hmm. it's like to play young players and what it's like to play actual NBA veteran-type rotation players and what kind of difference that makes for a team almost immediately. You don't even need a training camp. You don't even need really a, like a legit couple of practices. It's just like, no, insert NBA rotation players play better. Like mm-hmm. it, It's pretty simple, and the Hornets haven't been able to pull it off for the past couple of years. It was refreshing. It was amazing. It is reviving me, uh, and I can't watch. I can't wait. I cannot wait to watch them play again. That is not something that I've been saying much lately. I'm, I'm excited. I am not kidding, and I'm totally here for it. I am not kidding when I told when I tell you my Hornets timeline was celebrating just as much as any Kansas City Chiefs fan that I saw in my timeline. <laughs> there are there are We've different been down bad there man. Are different we have levels been down to this. bad. Yeah, we have been. All right, let's move on and see if anybody can help us out of this down badness that we've experienced for so long. Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. I told you last uh, time that we would explore some of the names that could be your new Hornets general manager. We'll do that coming up in the last segment of Locked on Hornets. Before we do that, I want to tell you that this episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google assistant google maps and google play store are built right into the 12.3 inch high definition touchscreen and format system the 2024 rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure if you want to try something different they also have the 2024 nissan armada that will change what you expect from a full-size suv you can picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style, you can tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Let's go back to the GM search. Mitch Kupchak is moving to an advisory role with the Hornets organization. And he did say this, Doug. He did say that this was always the plan. And I think we knew this too. I can go back to not this past off season, but the one before that when media, uh, when Mitch Kupchak held media availability and there were these rumors about possibly then Mitch Kupchak moving into an advisory role. And then I asked him, are you going to be moving to an advisory role? Or are you going to still be here as general manager? I hadn't been <laughs> asked yet. So I was like, all right, let's throw it out there. Let's throw out a feeler. And then Mitch just straight up told us, nope, got a new contract. Just signed it not too long ago, two years. Yeah. And I'm going to be the GM for the duration of that two-year contract. Now, I guess that's not technically true with him getting moved midseason. But still, that was effectively what took place. And we just procrastinated that idea or we moved it a little bit later. And so here we are in 2024 carrying out this new idea. Well, it 
it is the plan in the same way that if I crash my car and the airbag comes out, like that was always the plan, right. but I certainly didn't desire to get into the crash and have the airbag deployed. Like Mitch has, I predicted this uh, a few shows ago that this was most likely going to be how this played out, that Mitch was not going to, you know, here's a box, go clean out your desk and security will walk you out. There's just too many, there's a web of relationships. And so if you're looking at this from the outside and you're like celebrating, okay, Mitch is moving on. They're going to bring in a new name. This signals, you know, a move away from the Jordan era. This signals that the new owners are like really taking ownership. It's not quite that. I think there for the next however long, there are going to be little webs of previous eras because that's what you get when you bring mm -hmm. in a new ownership group and the previous owner remains part of that ownership group and and maybe a not so insignificant part maybe he's not involved but the name is still there and has relationships with the new owner so that's what's going to happen but look i mean i'm sorry like this was not the plan all along okay if if they had made if they had made a run and they were in playoff contention right now mitch kupchak would still be the general manager and he'd still be the general manager next season I just wonder with the age stuff, though, like I'm not I mean, you're you're right. Like, I'm not saying it went swimmingly for him. I, I do wonder if Mitch Kupchak, you know, being what what is he now? 70. I think he's 70 right on the dot. So if that's maybe, but you're right. Like, it's not like it went well enough for him to say, OK, yeah, now we need to have you. And so now he's moving on. He'd be a youthful and president of the United States. He would be. Yeah, he'd be the he'd be the best. Uh, although the the debates would be amazing with Mitch. Kupchak. What? What's going on? You know, <laughs> Um, I would love to have that would be a, a great SNL skit if we had if we had like niche Charlotte SNL, which we do. Hey, I mean, we, we should see that, you know, America, uh, land of the free, you know, mm -hmm. home of the well, you know, I'm not going to go into it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm a fan of the Atlanta Braves. But I like I like Atlanta. It was a great World Series. Um, we can move on to the next GM and figure out who that might be. So here's what Woj tweeted after the news broke earlier this morning. Woj said among several league executives expected to be considered in the process when hiring the new GM, New Orleans GM Trajan Langdon, Brooklyn assistant GM Jeff Peterson, Cleveland GM Mike Ganzi, Philadelphia GM Elton Brand, mm -hmm. and others, others, sources tell ESPN. Now, there are two names that immediately become intriguing because of what we talked about when Jake Fisher joined Weston Walker and said, I don't want to give you the actual name because it feels insensitive to be discussing this guy as the new GM when there already is one in place, right? We talked with Jake mm -hmm. Fisher a few weeks ago. Mitch Kupchak was already there. Jake Fisher didn't feel like it was, you know, the best thing to do to talk about who would take his job. He did give us a hint though, which was, I, you know, the decision making there from Jake. Okay. But the decision, the, the hint, the Easter egg, it was, a connection to Duke. And so Elton Brand and Trajan Langdon both have that connection to Duke. Now, Doug, we did not talk about Langdon. When he first said that, I was thinking, okay, Elton Brand is somebody. Like, that's the obvious one, the what one and done, you know, number one overall pick back in the day, Philadelphia GM, been in the spotlight. That makes sense. We flirted with like, oh God. They don't mean Danny Ferry, do they? Oh, we we panicked for like a brief, I don't know four hours. I was like, no, I, I hope not. But Trajan Langdon is the one here, Doug. And I think it comes down between those two guys with Langdon being very intriguing alongside Elton Brand because of that hint that Jake Fisher gave us. I think it's this list of names is really interesting because I can I think you can break it into to the two categories, the current like sitting GMs and Brand, Langdon and Gansey. And uh, Woj, I don't know if you mentioned this one too, but uh, Woj mentioned uh, LA Clippers Trent Redden also in this did um, not mention him so that's that's a name that Woj just floated as well and so that's one group and then the other group are names that we've heard of and they're a little bit lesser known names and they're sort of assistant gms or advisors or whatever and that's jeff peterson schlank those two names have been like the the top of the name list forever and wes wilcox and those are all guys too that have like direct connections to rick schnall from when he was atlanta hawks minority owner but what I love about that first group of names, all those names are guys that have, I think Langdon, I don't know about Langdon for sure, but certainly Gansey and Brand and Redden have been involved in a lot of trades for bigger names and, 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 and reforming 
rosters from the ground up using all available tools, draft, free agency, and trades. And so if that's really where they're going, hey, let's go out and snag someone else's general manager. Walker, if you're trying to convince yeah. Elton Brand, who's in Philadelphia, or Langdon in New Orleans, or Gansey in Cleveland, or Redden in Clippers, those are all winning teams. If you're going to bring a guy like that into the Hornets organization, exactly. He's making the money sign. You're going to have to open up that wallet, okay? So that's what intrigues me about this list of names as well. I would love to see the ownership group, especially after moving Cupchak to an advisory role and maintaining that relationship and that connection to Michael Jordan. I would love for them to set their stake in like, all right, no, no guy that I know from Atlanta or whatever, we're going to go out and get a name that maybe we're not as comfortable with, maybe is not a, as much of a known factor, but is a known factor in the NBA, is a guy that has made moves in the NBA, and we're going to open up the checkbook, just like we're doing with the practice facility and all these arena renovations, we're going to do the same thing for the on-court product and go out and get a big-name GM. So Trajan Langdon is interesting here, but also with Elton Brand, that that's the Atlanta connection, right? Because Elton Brand yeah. did, I think, play his last season in Atlanta, and then there was some you know maneuvering in the front office alongside and, until he get gets the uh, GM job in Philadelphia for a while. And so there's the Atlanta connection. I I wonder like when when everybody threw out Travis Schlenk, that's the name everybody hits their wagon to at first because it made the most sense. Success having built a squad that at least got to the Eastern Conference Finals, has the Atlanta connection with Rick Schnall, who was a minority with that owner, with that uh, organization for a while. And so that was, like when, when people would tell you sources are telling me Travis Schlink could be considered, I wonder if those sources were just people in other front offices guessing, telling their guesses to insiders, insiders telling us, yeah, sources tell me, Others believe it could be Travis Slink, right? Where it wasn't actually like a, based off any knowledge. Now I want the Duke connection. Like, I mean, you're trying to tell us something here. And so maybe it's Langdon, maybe it's Brand, but you're right, Doug. Already a good sign. Already a good sign because it shows we know what we're going to have to do to pry Langdon off of a team that is looking to contend this year. And even if you wanted to move off of a bunch of those, like you're talking about how many first round picks you could get in return for Zion, for Brandon Ingram, for a couple of other players that they have. Same thing for Philly. You know, Philly might just be a tough job, but you know, right? Like, you know, Darren Morey is the guy yeah. there. Yeah. But so he's the one that's calling all the shots with Philadelphia. But when Elton Brand is, you know, another guy that you could consider you have to wonder what kind of money could be going his way. So, yeah, very interesting to see those two Duke connections. And then Mike Gansey, I, for those that are very entrenched in mid-2000s college basketball, I want West Virginia great Mike Gansey to bring Kevin Pitsnoggle alongside him, and then he has to become the easy choice because I want to say Pitsnoggle as often as I can on Lockdown Hornets. Was Gansey the guy who got the Donovan Mitchell deal done, right? I mean, that's he's got to be the guy, right? I don't know. I have, um, yeah, I have to look I into it. So. This is yeah, it's breaking news here. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not up to date on my Gansey knowledge. But if he's the guy mm -hmm. that got the Donovan Mitchell deal done, that's exactly the kind of guy that I want in the general manager seat. Somebody that can go after the big fish. And here's the, here's what I really want. I mean, that would be nice. But here's what I really want. I want someone that can come in and be honest about the sins of the past, about the failures, and maybe they can't do it publicly as as much as I would like. But the danger of keeping Mitch Kupchak around is that you can't be honest within those internal conversations about, hey, there's some stuff that we really messed up here. What gives me hope is that ownership was super involved in the trade deadline, and they broke down a lot of what Mitch Kupchak built up and trading away PJ almost had Miles allowed it. They probably would have traded Miles too. And um, th then, of course, Gordon Hayward moving to OKC. So you break a lot of that down. You release James Booknight after you release Kai Jones. That 2021 draft, completely over. And... You know, that th they're the players they brought back to me was a recognition of, hey, here's the thing that we've been missing actual mm -hmm. NBA rotation players off the bench, players that can make plays if and when, honestly, LaMelo Ball gets hurt. I mean, that's the way it's been, unfortunately. And, and so there's a recognition there that, that there were some things that didn't happen in the past that need to happen. I hope that continues, and I hope the name that they bring in can be honest about those and move this franchise forward.
That'll do it for a lot of information coming at you on Lockdown Hornets. We'll have plenty more to say as the week goes on, so make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you push notifications. This is a great time for those notification buttons to be on when you subscribe to Lockdown Hornets on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts because we're still pumping out audio content. You don't just have to watch these pretty faces. You can listen to these beautiful voices as well. And so Every we single day. We're that. on every day. That's crazy. It's crazy, especially because I'm sure that a lot of people have – maybe gone away from the Hornets, taking care. And listen, I don't blame anyone. That, that, the whole mm-hmm, thing about right. being a sicko is that you can't help but watch the Hornets. You're sick in that way. I don't blame anyone for taking a break from the Hornets, a little you know, mental siesta or whatever. But, um, but if you're back all of a sudden, we're still on every day. We're here for you. Whenever you're ready to get back into the Hornets this season, we are here for you every single day. All right, that'll do it for Locked On Hornets. Continue to make us your first listen. We appreciate you for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast. Again, that includes YouTube. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow to try to clean up everything else we didn't get to today.